Hello and welcome to Schoolhouse Equity in Education. I am your host, Allison R. Brown, Executive Director of the Communities for Just Schools Fund, or CJSF, where we provide resources and support to community-based organizations that are working to ensure equity in their schools. Go to cjsfund.org to subscribe to our e-newsletter. If you're tweeting, follow me at Allison R. Brown and tweet about the show with the hashtags C4JS or Communities for Just Schools, and that's with the number four. Today on Schoolhouse, we are welcoming Jenny Arwadi and Carlil Pittman of Voice, Voices of Youth in Chicago Education. Voice is a youth-led education and racial justice alliance in Chicago that really has been a leader in the state of Illinois recently in bringing about change from the upper echelons of state government there. So we get to talk about that. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. So, you know, we're talking with Voice today because of a recent and really tremendous victory that you all have been a part of there in Illinois. Carlil, what is Senate Bill 100 and, and how did it come about? Senate Bill 100 was our common sense discipline campaign in the beginning. So the way that it came about was in CPS, a lot of times we see a lot of racial disparities taking place where we have students being suspended and expelled and being punished with these zero tolerance policies in schools, whether it's talking back to a teacher and they're being suspended from class or grades are low and they're being pushed out of school or play fighting with, or talking back. Uh, were all like things that these are college policies were having students being suspended or expelled for. And the reason for SB 100 is to make sure that zero tolerance is taken out and that it directly addresses the student prison pipeline. Jenny, you are the co-executive director of Communities United there in Chicago, and you're also the founder of the Albany Park Neighborhood Council, which really houses voice. Am I right about that? And, and what is Communities United? What is voice? Albany Park Neighborhood Council actually went through a name change, so we are now Communities United. And so we are a grassroots racial justice organization. Communities United is intergenerational and works on a range of racial justice issues through an intersectional lens. So we work on education justice, on health care and housing access. We work on youth investment and, of course, dismantling the school-to-prison pipeline and ensuring community reinvestment is a huge part of our priorities. In 2007, we came together to form Voice and to really build a citywide voice for young people to be able to challenge structural racism and specifically student pushout. So Voice is housed within Communities United, and we bring together young people and allies citywide. Carlyle, say a little bit more about structural racism and how that was really, that was playing out or has been playing out in schools before SB 100. Yeah, so the way social racism uh, was working was that, statistically speaking, looking at the numbers and realizing that our black and brown students and our students of color were being punished more harshly, more than their white counterparts. And you have to really look at that and say, you know, really it's not because, you know, they're just bad students and they're getting into more trouble, but really because it was a, a looking at it through a racial lens mm-hmm. and looking at it and realizing that a black student is five times more likely to be suspended or expelled than his white counterpart for the same, you know, offense. And through voice, when we tried to talk to CPS about the issue, and then they were telling us that it was a state issue. So it was, that's how we began the policy for SB 100. But over the course of years, how were you using research and the academy to really support what you knew to be true from your own experiences in school? Really, it goes back to, like Jamie was just talking about how voice started in 2007. And really, it started with a group of students uh, in a school who were curious because the number of students in school kept decreasing. And when they were talking to the administration, trying to figure out well, why, why is the, the suspension and enforcement rate so high? And they were being told that all the students who are either getting kicked out of school or dropping out of school are pregnant or the game baby. Mm. And when they looked at the research, it wasn't adding up. So that's when they decided that we could do something about this because they're forcing kids out of school and push them to the student prison pipeline. And through SB100 and lobbying for SB100, and going to Springfield to talk to these legislators about it, sometimes we get the pushback that this is a Chicago issue. 
this isn't a state issue. I'm not saying this in my in my district. Mm-hmm. And having those numbers with us, showing them that, you know, that a million school days, especially school days were lost because of suspension and expulsions across the state. And then showing them the number of suspension and expulsions in their district. Being able to have the stuff with us is really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it was key. In 2008, we came together with other groups to meet with key representatives from the Department of Education and Department of Justice. And over years, that led to working with the Council of State Governments, as well as DOE and DOJ, on the development of federal guidance on school discipline. And through that process, we were also very excited to have the Office of Civil Rights start releasing data on school discipline that was disaggregated by race. Is that the Federal Office for Civil Rights or the state? Yes, the Federal Office. Mm -hmm. And so as Carlyle was mentioning, we were able to look at statewide numbers Mm -hmm. across Illinois, which was able to provide further evidence to the student stories and experiences that we were sharing and be able to show that the federal government actually had numbers to back up um, these lived experiences that young people were sharing. So what we found through that research was that Illinois had one of the highest suspension rates of black students in the country Mm -hmm. and specifically black students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we knew the problem was very severe in Chicago, but we were really able to get a closer look at how it was impacting students of color across the state. Mm -hmm. And we also knew that numbers were being dramatically underreported. And so, in fact, the problem Mm -hmm. was far greater than any of the data actually was able to capture. So this information was really critical in helping us to secure support from our champions of the bill. Senator Kimberly Lightford and Representative Will Davis really did huge amounts of work in terms of really responding to the voice of young people, to the experiences of student push-out. And really, it was a huge, heavy lift to be able to create this statewide change to impact students of color in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And it was really looking at this from a racial justice issue that helped us to get champions to see how urgent a crisis this was. The first bill that we passed was SB 2793, which provides data transparency now in Illinois across all publicly funded schools. And so we were able to make the case how the Federal Office of Civil Rights data is a great first step, but one, it's not released annually, and we really need annual measures to be able to look at our progress. And also, we really need to be able to look across traditional neighborhood schools as well as charter schools in order to be able to see the full scope of the problem. So that was our first victory in 2014 that helped pave the way for SB 100 to pass in 2015. And tied to that first piece of legislation was also a requirement that districts that were in the top 20% of racial disparities and discipline would actually have to submit and report on improvement plans that they were creating on how they were going to address those disparities. Mm -hmm. So it's been really critical to us through that legislation, through SB 100, and also through our implementation efforts to make sure that we're really monitoring and also ensuring implementation through a lens that confronts racial bias and racial disparities. And and let us add... uh i like to get more into what S100 really does. Sure. And could you share also your personal experience, Carly, that led you into the work? So the main purpose of S100, like I said, is to address the student prison pipeline. For myself, the way I got involved, almost got involved into the student prison pipeline was um, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was actually kicked out of school for cutting the class. The reason I cut the class is because I was in lunch and my girlfriend, she had told me that she was pregnant. Mm. And, you know, me being so young in high school, I'm just sitting there because I know what to think, how to process it, anything. So I'm just sitting there. So the bell rang, the period changed, and I still sat there. So the security noticed I was there in the previous period, and he took me down to the discipline office. And when I got in the discipline office, they asked me what was my name because they didn't know me. I've never been suspended from school before. Mm-hmm. And they pulled my name. I was like, okay, his grades are kind of low. Let's just kick him out of school. It was like the walk to the office was longer than the decision to kick me out of school. Wow. At the time, I didn't know my right. Carlyle, who made the decision to kick you out? I know who the two discipline officers were, but the one who 
spoke him to do it. I don't know who she was. Was she the principal? I know she wasn't the principal. Mm. Like I said, they know who I was. I don't know who she was. I've never been in a discipline office before. Mm-hmm. Nobody asked me what was going on. Did I need to talk to someone? Was there something bothering me? I didn't know that I was supposed to have a trial either. And that they kicked me out of school, it made the next two and a half months of my life extremely difficult because I couldn't find another school to let me in because I thought I was a problem child because I had been kicked out of school. You were expelled from school? Yes. Just for missing Excuse class? Me? What was the basis for the expulsion? Uh, for coming class. Wow. I couldn't find another school to let me in because they all saw me as a problem child. And they were just telling me, okay, well, you go somewhere else for a semester and then come back here and we'll see. So they went from that to even trying to go to a school outside of Chicago to live with my aunt so I can get a school. They would still wouldn't let me in. Eventually, I ended up at my neighborhood high school, which my mother was trying to avoid sending me to because of his reputation. Mm-hmm. And when I got there, I had to go to Saturday school, summer school, and night school from my sophomore year until senior year so that I can catch up from all of those credits that I had missed out on for being kicked out of mm-hmm. school. And I don't think that their school had me in their best interest when they decided to kick me out of school, put me through this. And a lot of students don't have that strong support system at home like I had to keep them on track, to make sure that they don't fall into the student prison pipeline. And it was then, to my senior year at my new school, that I found out about the voice program and what it does and the student youth development that it has and the leadership that it teaches you. And from there is when I began fighting against these conduct conduct from school and zero tolerance policies and which is like the main purpose of SB 100. Mm -hmm. So being a part of SB 100 was really just a chance for me to share my story and the story of so many other unheard youth in my city in the area who are dealing with the same issues that these legislators don't know is going on. They feel like it's just an issue that they can just push to the side. Mm -hmm. And with SB 100 you can no longer suspend a student for 10 days unless they're a threat to another student or staff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we have students being suspended for 10 days for talking to a teacher or play fighting in the halls or in the cutting class, things like that. They're being suspended for two weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. And though you've been suspended for two weeks at a time, you come back to school and you're completely lost on what was going on in school. So the most suspended student for now is three days. Mm -hmm. There's no more counseling out where counselors are telling students like, you know, you're old enough to drop out. You know, school isn't for everyone. No more fines and fees for schools. We have a story of a student when she went to a charter school and candy wasn't allowed in the building. And they found a pack of gum or a big bag and charged her a dollar per piece of gum. And they wouldn't let her graduate without paying that fine. I want to put an underline there for people. (laughs) She had a pack of gum. This is a high school student who's enrolled in a public, public charter school or public school? It was a charter school. So she's enrolled in the public charter school. She had a stick of gum and she was, there was a rule in the code of conduct that said no gum or candy on campus. Yeah. So she was charged for each piece that she had in her possession. Yes. She was charged a dollar per piece and they wouldn't let her graduate without paying it. And as that student said, it was about $6 and her mother uh, was a single mother who stayed home and was also on disability, she had serious illness. And so to the student, as she put it to legislators, you know, $6 might not seem a lot to you, but to my family, it was a difference between having dinner that night and not. Mm. So these type of fines and fees were really prevalent among specifically one charter network. That's the largest charter network in Chicago. And through the efforts to pass SB 100, we actually got the charter network to drop the use of fines and fees that it said were a hallmark of its discipline model as we were having our committee hearings on the issue and building legislative support, which was huge. Another example was a young man who would come to school every day and his top button was missing on his shirt. Mm -hmm. So that meant that he was out of uniform. So they kept telling him every day to button his top button, but he kept telling them that his mother couldn't afford to buy him a new shirt. So instead of working with him to, you know, provide him a new shirt or to, you know, provide an exception to their policy or to change their policy altogether, every single day he would get a $5 fine for being out of uniform. Mm -hmm. And so it got to the point where the student was extremely depressed and almost suicidal. 
because there was nothing he could do to remedy the situation. And then when his mother tried to transfer him, the school would not provide his transcript until the full amount of the fine was paid, which had really amounted to significant amounts of money, hundreds of dollars. Mm. So SB 100 now is huge because it prohibits that across the state. And that's critically important because other charter networks and also other public schools had started to actually pick up that practice. So both getting that one network as well as prohibiting it across the state was a huge undertaking. We talk on this show about the things that happen in schools that are populated predominantly by black and brown young people. And so I want to ask you both to tell us the stories that you were hearing from young people, the ticketing, the suspensions and expulsions, the experiences that you all um, have lived and seen. Were those things happening to white children in the district? So we were seeing some of it happening to white children, like the example that Carlyle gave of the student with a pack of gum. She was a white student who was one of the few white students at a predominantly immigrant diverse school. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we never see these things happen to white students. And specifically, we got some outreach as we were working on the campaign from mothers, for example, of white students who had disabilities, Mm -hmm. you know, had, had autism or other challenges that they were facing, who were facing harsh discipline because the school was not equipped to be able to deal with what were not behavioral problems, but were other challenges. But when we look at the student experiences, as well as the numbers, the disparities were huge. So it's not to say that it was solely black and brown students, but you know, greatly disproportionately impacting black and brown students and even more so black students within CPS. So what did the activism look like on your part? What were you doing? Who were you meeting with? When did you really start? The main thing about voice is that it's completely youth-led and youth-advocated. And youth are always at the forefront and at the table of decisions being made. So when we decided that we're going to take this to Springfield and turn into a policy, we worked with different organizations that are part of Voice, along with organizing some lawyers, and created uh, the bill. And when we found a legislator to carry our bill, the process of lobbying and being in Springfield began, where at weeks at a time, for a couple of days, we all take like a busload of students or a train load of students to Springfield, and we spend the entire day in the Capitol meeting with these legislators, telling them about our bill and about our experiences and our stories, um, and trying to gain their support. Mm-hmm. And also, there were negotiation tables for the different people who, who were either allies or against our bill, and we have to come to you know agreements in order to pass our bill. What kinds of backlash were you getting as you were taking bus loads and train loads of young people to activate around this? Who were your dissenters and and what did that backlash look like? So we had huge opposition to the piece of legislation that we were putting forth um, from anyone from Chicago Public Schools to the Illinois School Management Alliance, which is made up of all the superintendents and principals, the separate Illinois Principals Association. Then there were different geographic-based groups of school management entities who were all opposed. We were also opposed by the Cook County State's Attorney as well as the Illinois State's Attorney's Association. So really, the momentum that we had was young people at its core. (laughs) We had allied organizations from across the state who were supporting the efforts of the young people. We also had the Chicago Teachers Union who was supportive. So to us, it was really interesting that, you know, students and teachers who were closest to the situation, um, a lot of the backlash really tried to say that we were going to make schools unsafe. 
And so why would teachers and students, who are actually the ones in the classroom every day, what vested interest would they have in making schools unsafe, mm-hmm. right? So if they're the ones saying that this is the type of change we need to actually create safer schools to allow restorative justice to prosper, to be able to ensure that students are not pushed out into the criminal justice system, then we really need to listen to their voice. Mm -hmm. So it took two years of negotiation table discussions where we were really just given attempt after attempt to just completely weaken the bill to the point where it would have had you know, no impact at all. Mm -hmm. And we were really proud that the students just never gave up. Our sponsors stayed strong on the issue. And we ended up with a really strong uh, piece of legislation. The one piece that was taken out that we are still working on is around the issue of school arrests. So like I mentioned, it was really interesting because, again, all these different entities were trying to make the case in different ways that we were trying to create unsafe and dangerous schools. So then, right as we were working on this piece around school arrests, a flyer came out basically saying how we were going to be allowing dangerous criminal acts to be happening in schools, Mm -hmm. things like bomb threats, really egregious, violent, and sexual acts occurring in the schools were listed out. And it was a fear tactic made by, you know, opposing forces. At that point, we were not able to move forth with this one piece around limiting school arrests, which was a key part of our bill. Right now, it deals with suspensions, expulsions, fines, counseling out, and zero tolerance overall. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge piece of work that we're undertaking in implementation to best pass follow-up legislation that explicitly deals with that and the racial bias. And I think, you know, even as we've seen great declines In um, exclusionary discipline in CPS, we've also been working with schools to really build capacity around implementation and specifically looking at racial bias in implementation. In 2014 and 15 in CPS, there were 48 police notifications of students from pre-K to second grade, Mm. and those are predominantly black students. And then, of course, the number overall is much higher when looking at full elementary, middle school, and high school. And you're talking pre-K three-year-old children. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a single situation in which case a pre-K to second grade student could be doing anything that would require police notification. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about normal behaviors, any child. And to be honest, that's what we see also in middle and high school, that these are normal behaviors of any child, for the most part, that students are getting arrested for. The law was passed. It was signed into law by the governor at the end of August and took effect last week. Mm -hmm. You know, it's only been a couple of days now, but how's it going? How are things? Even though the bill has passed, the more important thing right now is the implementation process of it and making sure that people know about it and know their rights. So we partner with the Chicago Lawyer Committee who's doing Know Your Rights trainings and uh, S100 presentations across Chicago, across the state, they're willing to go anywhere, wherever they can to do these trainings. And I make myself available to go to high schools to give a presentation on SB100. And, you know, they have a request for uh, some Know Your Rights cards. We have these little cards, Know Your Rights, uh, with the, the law on it. They, they can carry around with them or just pass out to other people so that they're all aware of what's going on. So mainly it's trying to figure out different ways and more areas to be able to go and uh, outreach and do these Know Your Rights trainings. You've both talked a lot about implementation and implementation efforts. What does that look like? Is there training available for educators? And how are you involved? How is voice involved in those implementation efforts? Now, in terms of implementation, one piece is uh, statewide administrators training. So we have partnered, as Carlyle said, with the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and uh, trainings for administrators statewide and in different districts are being held across the state and in places like Joliet, Des Plaines, Hillside, Wheaton, uh, Kankakee. 
And those are bringing together restorative justice practitioners, school psychologists, as well as lawyers to be able to provide a framework for not only what compliance with the law says, but how do we really, to the fullest extent, implement restorative alternatives with full fidelity? And how do we look at racial bias to ensure that as we're implementing SB 100, that we don't continue to have uh, disparities? Mm -hmm. Voice is working on a specific component of those trainings, which is around student engagement. We believe that strong implementation isn't just a handbook to be followed, but it involves the really meaningful involvement of of students um, in the school as partners in implementing and in building positive school climates. So we're currently working on a piece of that statewide administrator academy that focuses on effective student engagement. We've also been working over the past two years Through the Forward Promise Initiative, we were able to receive support from the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation around partnering with the Chicago Teachers Union Quest Center and Alternatives Inc. here in Chicago. The Quest Center is the professional development arm of the Chicago Teachers Union. So we were able to partner to create, to actually implement restorative practices combined with policy advocacy, of course, in specific schools that span the racial black and brown divides in Chicago and are about to release in the next couple of months a teacher's guide to restorative practice. And we're really excited about that because it's kind of a living, breathing document. Mm -hmm. It's not just kind of a one-to, how-to type thing, but it provides a framework of the philosophy. It provides concrete tools for teachers. And then it's part of a long-term project with the Chicago Teachers Union Quest Center to really incorporate professional development around a restorative practice, confronting racial bias, and building supportive school climates into the ongoing PD that CPS teachers receive. So we're really excited about that because it's just a different angle and way to be able to reach educators and really connect with, you know, not having another mandate or top-down approach. It's about reconnecting with why did teachers get into this in the first place, right? It's for the love of young people, right? And wanting to really help them realize their full potential. So we've had amazing partnerships with teachers at local schools, with the Chicago Teachers Union, Quest Center folks and C2 leadership to really help make this work happen and move forward. I really appreciate the discussion about the partnerships that are forming between teachers and youth leaders. I think that's really an important track and it's it's been a missing conversation or or a missing frame, I think, to the work around school discipline reform and building healthy school climate. But those partnerships between teachers and students, is that's a really important component of any successful strategy, I think. And so I appreciate that you all are doing that. And I appreciate the, the intergenerational, you're prioritizing the intergenerational aspect of that work too. And I we certainly value the power of stories. And so I would, you know, we, we try, have been trying to close with a story on the show. So I would love for, for you, Carlyle and Jenny to tell us just a story about the success of bringing youth voice together with teachers, with others in, in the work um, for better schools. Carlyle, do you have a, a story that comes to mind? You know, going to Springfield is very tiresome taking students and one other people to Springfield waking up at four o'clock in the morning Mm -hmm. to take these rides to Springfield to be up all day to talk to these legislators who don't believe us what's going on with us and consistently going and getting to the point where when we walk into the building with our blue voice t shirts on, they know it's us and they're expecting us and they're waiting for us to come and sit down and talk to them and actually passing the bill and now being able to move on to the third part of our bill, which is to educate on the carceral piece and making student-based arrests at last resort in schools. And they're not only coming already, so now we've been able to build up momentum and power uh, behind our name and behind our students. So I think it's just an exciting time and a good time to be able to uh, keep you at the forefront and make these changes continue to happen. And I would add uh, another story through the conversations around implementation and looking at race, gender, and zip code with a team of teachers at one of the local schools. I think it was 
really powerful when, uh, you know, through the process, we were kind of going through separate tracks with teachers and with students and then bringing folks together. And I think it was really powerful experiences of young people being able to share experiences specifically with the large amounts of school closures and school actions. Young people have to travel, in many cases, very long distances Mm -hmm. to go to school, and it's specifically black students in the city of Chicago who are facing that at the most extreme levels. So when young people were sharing their experience of what it's like to have to get up, you know, at five in the morning to be able to take three buses and a train to get to school Mm -hmm. and then how exhausted they are and stressed out just by the time that they enter the school building and to have educators who are in the core group really listening intently and really empathizing with that situation And being able to, we see so often, especially when you're talking about issues of race, there can be a tendency to be defensive, right? Or to not want to think that you yourself have racial bias or that you're promoting any sort of uh, structural racism in the work. Mm -hmm. And by building these relationships and having young people working together on a personal level, I think that those relationships really open up those conversations to how do we not judge ourselves? How do we not take personally or get defensive about problems that might be happening in our school? But how do we really listen to these lived experiences and look at the data to really be able to take leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And that we are not showing weakness by admitting there's a problem. We're actually showing leadership by being at the forefront of creating change. What would you say, Jenny, are the potential ripple effects outside of Illinois? Are you aware of other states that are are moving in, in this direction? Yeah, so we've been getting some requests from folks in a couple of different states. Indiana, we were invited to a presentation down there with state legislators and community organizations, parent groups. And then we were also reached out to by folks in Minnesota. And then a lot of our, you know, allies across the country have been looking at SB 100 as well. So I think that there are, you know, a lot of ripple effects in terms of folks looking at SB 100 as a model uh, for change across the country because it is the most comprehensive statewide change in the country to date. And it also applies to all publicly funded schools, which is huge. Mm -hmm. And then I think added ripple effects would be, so I recently saw someone from the Illinois Educational Association or from the NEA, National Educational Association, at a conference, and she was talking about how the IEA was working on downstate implementation in Illinois. And we constantly run into new partners that are working on SB 100 implementation that are folks we haven't worked deeply in the past and haven't actually kind of formally met with around implementing Mm -hmm. the bill. So I think that in addition to national ripple effects, just seeing kind of that movement in Illinois where now there are lots of folks really moving in sync in the same direction is huge, you know, kind of building off of the momentum that the Voice Young People lead. And also with the charter school issue, you know, many allies in the Communities for Just Schools Fund and the former Just and Fair Schools Fund really helped to elevate a lot of the stories that we were finding with charter school discipline. And so we know that there were many kind of things that helped to play into that, but the federal government helping to issue guidance on charter discipline, we also believe is a huge ripple effect from our work and from other groups' work across the country. Carlil, what advice do you have? What are you thinking that you would like to pass on to other other organizers, other advocates around the country who are really wanting to do something about their schools and not quite sure where to start? Share your experience, share your story, because no one can explain your story like you can. You can have statistics and everything you need to try to talk to someone, but if it's not connected to the heart, the heart shows. That's how you get your support. And you know, being able to, to have a group and, and leave for always for youth in the front, because a lot of times you feel like they don't have a voice and adults feel like you shouldn't have to be at the table when these decisions are being made. But if you're trying to solve a problem about a specific group of people, why not have those people at that table? Mm -hmm. No one knows their problem like they do. Thank you both so much for joining us. 
on Schoolhouse today. This has been really enlightening, and I, I want to congratulate you on this victory of Senate Bill 100, SB 100, which is really a first of its kind in terms of the breadth of measures there that are in place to ensure healthy learning environments for young people. So congratulations to both of you and to Voice and to the network of allies that you all have been a part of and and really been mobilizing to bring about this incredible legislation. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you so much, Allison. Jenny Arwadi and Carlyle Pittman are with Voice in Chicago. Voice is Voices of Youth in Chicago Education. We are so excited that they are part of our network, part of the Communities for Just Schools Fund network, and happy to be talking with them. Jenny, how can folks find you online if they're looking for you? They can just go to www.voiceproject.org or they could email Carlyle at Carlyle, C-A-R-L-I-L at voiceproject.org. Thanks to everyone for listening in. Remember that you can follow me at Allison R. Brown on Twitter and sign up for the Communities for Just Schools Fund newsletter at cjsfund.org. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful week.